Happy New Year and welcome to our kickoff webinar for 2024 from the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation MS Focus. I'm Sherry Bin, the patient healthcare liaison for the foundation, and I'll be taking your questions today. So let me tell you, first of all, how you can ask questions. Um, you can type your questions into the chat if you're on Zoom and also into the Q&A. Um, if you're on Facebook, just type them into the comments and we'll try to have them um, sent to the chat by our behind the scenes tech person. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just wanted to tell you how to ask those questions. If you're on the phone, you wanna hit star nine um, and that will allow your question to be typed in or you can um, also raise your hand if you're on Zoom. There's a little icon at the bottom center of your screen. Yesterday, we posted our weekly welcome to, um, to our Facebook page, our private Facebook page, which has actually about 25,000 members on right now. Um, we're getting between 50, and 70 new members on that page every single week. And yesterday, one of our members commented, so many people every week, why is more not being done? So that sort of sent me on an internet search because I know that there's a lot of research going on right now. And um, I just wanted to be get some numbers to sort of help people realize what is actually going on. Worldwide, if you go to the site clinicaltrials.gov, Bavia has just put that site in the chat for anybody that wants to see it. I searched for MS clinical trials on that. And currently there are 639 trials, um, specific trials, many of which have many different sites around the country and around the world. 639 studies on relapsing remitting MS. For primary progressive MS, there are 94 active studies, again, with many sites for each study. Um, for secondary progressive MS, 134 studies. And for myelin repair, um, eight studies currently. With those myelin repair studies, the two in the United States are in California. Um, there are six outside of the U.S., mostly in France and Germany. Um, so go to clinicaltrials.gov if you're interested in a particular trial for a particular type of MS. Um, the other thing that uh, somebody mentioned was that they were wondering why so many people were being diagnosed at this point in time. And we actually, in 2017, um, revised the McDonald's criteria, which helped us to diagnose people with MS. The McDonald criteria um, gives very specific ways that you can eyeball MS on an MRI or through a spinal tap, things like that, as well as your history. And you have to meet two out of three criteria of the, on that so that they can adequately diagnose you. When those criteria were revised in 2017, neurologists started taking a look at a lot of the people that had been diagnosed before 2005 or so and realized that about 25% of people with an MS diagnosis did not meet the criteria for that diagnosis. There are just so many things that mimic MS. So they're very specific about diagnosing right now. And we're actually getting about 200 people with a new MS diagnosis in the United States every single week. Uh, I see from Mary in the chat, how can I manage symptoms while I wait for a doctor's appointment? Um, managing symptoms is is difficult if you're not on a regimen already of a disease-modifying therapy. 
there are a number of things that you can do and their lifestyle types of things. You need to move. You need to exercise, not vigorous, like aerobic exercise, but you need to be moving and not be sedentary. The more you move, the less your fatigue is going to be. The more you exercise, the less your fatigue is going to be, and likely the less your pain will be. Um, as far as um, we used to tell people back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, that rest was good when you were coming out of a flare. Don't tell me, because rest can actually make it harder to recover. The only thing you might want to rest is eyes and stay off screen if you have a vision, uh, if you have your vision affected because of optic neuritis. So you want to stay off computers and off your cell phone if possible, but with optic neuritis until that's resolved. Um, dietary changes that can help calm symptoms are just eating as fresh and whole food as possible. Anything that's got preservatives or additives or dyes or flavor enhancers in it um, can actually make your symptoms worse. Sugar is a real um, trigger for a worsening of your MS symptoms, whether it's toxicity or food. And if you have a lot of sugar in your diet, you're probably going to want to um, really not taper off of it, but just cold turkey stop. And it's not going to be easy. And it's probably going to take two or three weeks before you start seeing an improvement. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So um, let me just, uh, let's see what we've got for other questions that have come in prior to this. Um, we had somebody this morning um, on Facebook ask about bladder control and whether interstim implants can help. Now, interstim is a device made by Medtronic. That's medtronic.com, M-D-T-R-O-N-I-C.com. And it can help some people um, with bladder control. I've talked to a few people who have had it uh, put in, and they're actually almost completely resolving incontinence issues with that. Um, about half of the people that I've talked to that have had it, uh, that are utilizing it, are finding about 50% or right about half of their their uh, incontinence is resolved. They're able to make it to the bathroom quicker without leaking. Uh, one in one day. An anonymous attendee says, moving is good, but if you have mobili mobility issues, it makes it hard. Options? There are a number of um, exercises, exercise programs that are done seated. And we have several of them on the MS Focus website. Um, so www.msfocus.org. And um, at least two or three a week, I believe, we have seated exercise um, and chair yoga and, and programs like that. Um, feel free, you don't have to get them just through the MS Foundation. Um, just search, do a Google search for chair yoga or seated exercises or exercises for elders. Um, a lot of exercise for older individuals can be done seated. The seated exercises can also be adapted to be standing. So there's a lot you can do as far as exercise is concerned when you're not walking. Um, even just, you know, shoulder shrugs and neck stretch, things like that. Um, get a soup can and, and do some hand uh, weights with a soup can. They're very easy to do. Anything like that 
is is very very helpful. Um, Mary asks, are there studies taking place now or in the past about laser therapy? Um, laser therapy for what, Mary? Uh, on what? Um, I don't know. At the moment, laser therapy doesn't jump out to me as something that's currently being studied related to MS. There's laser treatment for a lot of different conditions. Um, muscle cramping, she says. Um, I don't believe so. But I do know that muscle cramping is often helped by increasing your hydration. Um, about 90% of what is commonly known as a Charlie horse is a result of dehydration, not being well enough hydrated. My husband used to get such awful leg cramps at night when he was in bed that he would literally be jumping up maybe two or three times a night just to get rid of the cramps. And when he added an extra couple of glasses of liquid every single day, that completely stopped. Um, muscle cramping might also be a result of spasticity. And spasticity can be really helped in most cases, not necessarily completely taken away, but helped very much by stretching exercise. Um, there is um, a number of uh, brochures and guides, exercise guides on different MS sites, including msfocus.org, that give you tips on how to stretch some of your muscles. Certainly just standing with your hands against the wall and your feet maybe three feet away from the wall and just sort of doing push-ups against the wall will stretch those muscles in the backs of your legs and help to cut down on the cramping. Another question that uh, recently popped up on our Facebook page, actually, somebody was talking about baclofen, which is a drug that's used to treat um, spasms or spasticity. And they were at a maximum dose of baclofen every day, and they didn't feel that it was really healthy. There was a lot of cramping, particularly on the right side of the body. And um, if that is the case for you, if you're finding that the medicines for spasticity are not really addressing the issue for you, um, many of these medicines don't take the problem away entirely, but they can knock it down to where you can basically live and function with it. Um, you might want to have a conversation with your neurologist about a baclofen pump. Baclofen pumps are, they're about the size of a hockey puck, and they're inserted usually just under the skin of the abdomen, and they have a catheter coming out of them that goes into the space between your vertebra. So the baclofen itself, in a very, very tiny dose, just a fraction of what you would take orally, um, goes into the area around your spinal column. And because it's given right into that area, it is so much more effective than something that's swallowed and has digestive juices um, impacting it and that it becomes systemic. Um, it works much better around the spinal column and you don't get often the side effects that you do with oral baclofen like the drowsiness or the brain fog that comes with it. I should uh, sort of flip the screen and see if I can see any of the other questions that are coming in on Facebook.
Sherry, I don't see any on um, chat or on Q and A. Okay, I'm not good, <laughs> but but thank you for checking. For those of you that are watching, uh, the voice you just heard was Deb, who is our education coordinator for the Multiple Foundation. Uh, Kathy asks if there's anything that you can do specifically to reduce high liver enzymes. Yes, there is. Um, besides avoiding things like alcohol, uh, which tends to raise liver enzymes, um, if your liver enzymes are high, particularly because of the medication that you're on, like if you're on one of the interferons, for example, or maybe even uh, Abagio, those medications tend to sometimes raise liver enzymes in people. Uh, there is a supplement that has had a number of clinical trials done on it, and it works very, very well to lower liver enzymes, and that's called milk thistle. Um, the studies uh, are saying that up to 600 milligrams twice a day um, it can lower liver enzymes. And these studies were done on people that had um, enzymes that were elevated due to medication or due to hepatitis or due to cirrhosis, um, alcohol consumption. And all of those studies showed a reduction of liver enzyme levels um, in, in those persons taking milk thistle. Now, the one thing about milk thistle is that it you can't take it if you're on a blood thinner for any reason. So if you have atrial fibrillation, for example, and you're on a blood thinner or anticoagulant, you will not be able to take milk thistle. That's really the one medication that it strongly interacts with. Um, it can have side effects of uh, bloating or um, extra gas in your abdomen. Um, in some people, it can cause some loosened stool, but people with MS are often troubled by constipation. So a little bit looser stool may be a positive side effect. For you. So thank you, Kathy, for the question. Can you talk about Ocrevus, Denise said. Hi, Denise. I see you so often on our Facebook page. Um, yes, Ocrevus is basically a second generation rituximab or rituxin. Um, rituxin was in clinical trials until uh, probably 2008 or 9 uh, for for MS and was showing very good impact. And then the trials for Ocrevus started. And when Ocrevus was approved, um, the trials completely stopped with rituxan because rituxan was already approved for a couple of other conditions as well as um, MS. So we could use it off label. Rituxan in, and Ocrevus are very, very similar. What they do is they suppress specifically your, there are several different types of lymphocytes that seem to be impactful on um, disease activity with multiple sclerosis, particularly the CD19 and 20, they're a B and a T cell with those designations. Um, other drugs target other um, of the lymphocytes like uh, Lentrata or Aducanumab would target the CD4 and 8, um, Tysabri also. So you, we know that targeting certain specific lymphocytes does lower disease activity. That doesn't mean it's going to lower progression. Um, and I think people sometimes mistake that uh, they, they think that when they get onto a medication, their symptoms are gonna go away and they don't generally. They often will get a little bit better than, than they were before, but they don't generally go away. The damage that's done before you start the medication 
doesn't always repair itself. And so you may still have symptoms, you may still continue to progress. And um, the, the one thing about the B cell depletion medications, and they are the Ocrevus, the Rituxan, Briumvi, Truxima, and Casimta. Casimta is a monthly injection you can do at home. The others are done twice a year in infusion centers. So uh, those medications tend to inhibit our ability to really develop a robust response to a vaccine or an infection. So with COVID specifically, if you're going to start on one of these medications, it's preferable that you get your COVID vaccine, even if you've had COVID before, because the new vaccine that just came out in September is specific to the variants we're seeing right now, rather than to the variants from the original vaccine. So you get your vaccine out of the way, and um, and then a month or so afterwards, you can go ahead and, and start your medication. Um, we used to tell people before we really knew how the virus acted to get their vaccine, if they're, they were getting boosted or getting a vaccine to get it, um, as long after a dose of their B cell depletion therapy is possible. So we'd have them, if they were every six months, we'd have them get their vaccine five months after their infusion. So they'd have it for a month before their next infusion. We now know that these drugs, once you've been on them for a year or two, in other words, you've had at least two or three doses of the, this medication at six month intervals. We now know that the lymphocytes stay at the same level. So it doesn't really seem to make a lot of difference when you get the vaccines. Um, people that have been on this drug for longer than a year um, are more likely to pick up a new variant of COVID if they don't protect themselves. So I strongly recommend masking when you go into public places. Um, and there are a lot of people around, even if others aren't masked. Um, you owe it to yourself to protect you. Uh, Linda says, if you have a few flare-ups between ocrevus infusions, does that mean the medicine is not working? No, it doesn't mean it's not working. Um, your first year or so on these drugs, you may not have the flares completely under control. But again, doing things like cutting out your sugars, um, eating more whole foods and less processed foods are going to help. Staying active um, during that time is going to help. So thank you, Linda, for that question. Anybody else? I thought something had just popped. Is there anyone from... Sherry, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yay. Um, only because I know mostly everybody with MS is affected by heat. And so I've learned just recently that many people are also affected by cold. So I didn't realize that. How can you really, other than bundling up, how can you protect yourself against cold weather when you live up north? Bundling up is it. You layer so that if yeah. you warm, you take a layer off. Um, uh, I I like to keep a small space heater at my feet because if my feet get cold, um, pain ramps up, my vision goes wonky, I don't think as clearly. So uh, a, a small space heater, just be careful you don't leave it on when you're not in the room. Um, uh, certainly, like fleece lined boots or or socks. Um, there's there's a lot of socks and tights out there right now that are fleece lined, and they can help with an underlayer. Um, okay. You sometimes you have to get a little bit larger shoe. Uh, now, as far as the heat is concerned, about ninety percent of people with MS do have a heat intolerance. Mm -hmm. And at least 10% of a 
hold in power. Although I think as we age, as we progress with, with the MS, um, we probably have both. So uh, my husband tells me that my heat, my heat and cold tolerance have gone into a very narrow zone. And well, I, I know that with cut, there's so many devices and cooling products that you can use. But are are there anything like do they have cooling? I mean, heating devices that you can wear on you, like a cooling vest or a. I do. In fact, my my uh, sixteen year old grandson got battery operated heated mittens for skiing this winter. Nice. So just charge him with a little USB port. Um, and Polar Products is uh, one of our suppliers for our our cooling program that runs from February 1st to June 1st every year. And Polar Products has a whole slew of heat therapy products as well. So mm -hmm. polarproducts.com. Oh, uh, somebody just typed in, oh, let's see. Tracy uh, typed in her son has a battery operated winter jacket. So Good to know. Uh, heating blankets also help um, at night if you're getting chilled during the evening. Uh, let me get back to Tracy asked a question. My 19-year-old son was diagnosed with relapsing MS not quite a year ago and has been on Kacinta monthly injections since March. He still has symptoms, legs locking up, speech slurring. I know the medicine is supposed to slow the progress of the MS lesions, but it says it also helps with symptoms. Um, I found that the medications helped with my symptoms after I'd been on it for a while. I was still getting them. They were just less severe. They don't take the symptoms away. If you've got lesions that are causing your symptoms, it doesn't take the lesions away, but it deactivates them. So any damage that's done within that lesion stays. Now, the brain's a wonderful thing. The spine or the central nervous system is wonderful because if it, it creates detours around damaged areas. So over time, we do develop um, detours around the damaged areas. So you might find that you're learning to do things a little differently. Um, the pain, if you've got pain, is the sensation's changing, it's ramping down. Um, so um, I, I think after he's been on it for more than a year, he's probably going to start noticing things quieter. Um, Kathy asks, how long after a steroid infusion can you get vaccines and still allow them to be effective? I would, I would recommend that you wait at least four weeks after your steroid treatment has stopped before getting any vaccine. Tracy and uh, oh, Miss Tracy says we are in Wisconsin. I guess that's why the battery operated jacket. Um, Doris says I drink ginger root tea. Ginger is a warming herb. It is, and it's uh, it's very helpful um, to keep your insides warm during the winter. Um, and Doris also says it's great for it. Also calms the tummy. Uh, ginger chews also help. Yes, ginger can be very, very helpful. Licorice as well. Although licorice for some people can um, can boost the immune system a little bit. And we want to be real careful not to boost our immune system. Um, in MS, typically your immune system is usually a little overactive and you want to keep it from becoming more active. So our disease modifying therapies tamp down or moderate the immune system. You don't want to be taking herbs or meds to which you're sensitive to boost your immune system. Gus asks, do you know which disease modifying therapies don't affect the liver? I ask as a grade two liver, fatty liver person. Um, yes. Uh, Gus, generally, the the oral medications such as um, 
Hestadera and Jelenia, Mazan, do not uh, raise liver enzymes. Also, the um, the B cell therapy like Ocrevus, Rituxan, Cassandra, Lindsay, do not raise liver enzymes generally. Fatty liver disease is something that many people, most people with type 2 diabetes will develop. So if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, those might be drugs that you might want to consider having a discussion about with your doctor. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, I was on Rituxan for two and a half years. I was always having reactions, lots of fatigue, mobility issues, brain fog. I had a relapse and med was changed. I'm currently taking Tysabri for six months and finally feel the best I can take. What other meds are in that same family as Tysabri? I'm looking at that for when I might have to change meds in the future. Thanks. Um, Tysabri is the only medication that we currently have on the market other than its generic, which was just released recently, um, that, uh, that act in that specific way. Uh, as far as the rituxan is concerned, a lot of people, um, if they're getting a steroid pre-med with their rituxan, will complain about the community or eating this early. Some people that are really sensitive to steroids will have those types of side effects. So I'm seeing a lot of doctors now in people that are complaining about that sort of thing, do their pre-med with something like Benadryl and Tylenol instead of Solumedrol. So you might want to have that conversation with your doctor too. The other thing with Rituxan is, um, the dosing is variable. You don't have to stay on a specific dose. Spain did a uh, an extended clinical trial showing that 500 milligrams twice a year instead of 1,000 milligrams was quite sufficient and kept most people from um, having relapses. So the dosing might be an issue that you might want to discuss, guys. Thank you. Um, Shelly from Facebook asks, um, I have extreme pain in my leg. What's the best remedy? 22 years of primary progressive MS. Uh, Shelly, I, you know, I think that um, there are a number of things to help pain in legs. It depends on what the pain is from. If the pain is from spasticity, that can be addressed with stretching exercises and medications like baclofen or tizanidine, which also has the brand name of Xanaflex. Those are things that you might want to talk about. Um, massage could be helpful. Uh, physical therapy certainly can be an aid. Um, gabapentin or Neurontin is often um, prescribed for people who have um, spasticity that causes pain. And for some people, it can be very effective. For other people, it's not so effective. So those are things that I, I would recommend that you could. Gus says, thanks for the reply. I was on Flagrity, but the neurologist took me off. He suggested Texadera, Mason Flat, or Cassandra. Right, Gus. Those are all medications that are um, very helpful, particularly for people with fatty liver. Um, and he's also asking, uh, do you know if supplements increase liver enzymes? For, for example, omega-3, B3, et cetera. D3 actually, um, in some people, seems to, the higher the dose, uh, seems to raise liver enzymes. But again, the, the milk thistle that I was talking about a little bit earlier might be helpful if your enzymes are up and it's keeping you from taking certain prescribed medications or supplements. So, um, and again, milk thistle can be found over the counter at the chain drugstores like CBS or Walgreens. Um, and they come in dosing from 
I think 75 milligrams to 250 milligrams. When I was on, um, back when I was on Avonex and Rituxan, not, uh, not Rituxan, Avonex and Rubix, my enzyme tended to be two to three times the height of, uh, of top normal. And literally within two weeks of taking milk whistle, they came back into normal range. So you might want to do that. But again, if you're on any kind of a blood thinner or anticoagulant, milk whistle is not enough to bring it's going to, it's loaded with vitamin A, which can in, in people that are, have a potential to clot like that, cause of blood flow. Melissa from Facebook asks, do I need to worry about the side effects concerning liver if I take mazen? No, mazen is not one of the drugs that tweaks the liver enzymes, so you should be completely safe. By the way, um, while we're talking about mazent, recently we had a question on our Facebook page about why aren't there more, why aren't there any medications to treat secondary progressive MS? Mazent otherwise known as Depanamod, uh, was approved specifically um, for secondary progressive MS. It does seem to work in other forms of MS as well, but it also tends to slow the progression in secondary progressive MS in the clinical trials that they did. Um, Melissa asks, uh, for those of you that joined us a little bit later, we started the conversation with um, some talk about clinical trials that were ongoing. So in the chat, scroll way down to the bottom of the chat, um, clinicaltrials.gov is a site that you can always go to to look and see what clinical trials might be available to you um, in your area, what trials are being done for certain types of MS, um, for certain symptoms, that sort of thing. Healthline.com is another site that you can go to to find out demographics. Uh, from Healthline.com yesterday, um, I found that 200 people every single week on average are being diagnosed with MS in every single week here in the United States and a little over 300 worldwide. Uh, so, Bob, you just put them in the chat again, clinicaltrials.gov and healthline.com, if you want to be searching for anything on that. The other thing I want to bring to your attention as we start a new year, um, you can always send us uh, an email. If there's something you'd like to see a program on with you, um, send us an email at um, support at focus.org, or you can send it to me directly, Sherry, C-H-E-R-I, at msfocus.org, and we will try to address those issues. If you have concerns that you'd rather not talk to in such a phone forum as this, uh, have your name read aloud on a webinar. If you want more privacy than that, and you've got questions that need answering regarding your MS or regarding how to approach your doctor on a certain problem that you're having, um, feel free to give me a as well at Sherry and Focus.org. I try to get those answered in a timely fashion, generally within 24 hours, sometimes even within. So if there are questions that you have that you feel you need a personal answer for at any time, just I didn't say this in the introduction, and I'll, I'll take a minute right now since we don't have anything waiting for that. But um, I've been living with MS myself for at least 45 years. Um, it was 19 years of symptoms before I was finally diagnosed. And I was diagnosed shortly after our first medication came on the market back in the early 1990s. Um, the doctors that I had had during the previous 19 years all said when I told them 
that they were pretty sure that I had MS, but there wasn't any point in diagnosing me because there was nothing to treat it. Um, and so I waited another, I think, seven years after diagnosis to start a medication because all of the, me the medication that we had on the market then was for early MS. And there was a short enough supply that people that had only had symptoms for five years or 10 years at the maximum uh, were being given the drug. And since I'd been almost 20 years, by the time I was diagnosed, I wasn't eligible. But then I went to an MS specialist um, at the 26-year mark. And at that point, I was minimally ambulatory. And um, he put me on a, a five-day course of steroids, and my neurological exam and many of my symptoms got better when I saw him two weeks later, enough so that he, he put me on a disease modifying therapy. At that time, we had three on the market. Um, a couple of years later, I changed medication to the fourth one that had just come on the market in the United States. And that really turned things around for me. We don't often see that. We don't see enough of a resolution of symptoms as people are really progressing um, with disease-modifying therapies. At least we didn't 30 years ago and 20 years ago. Either. So um, I, I want to encourage you to get on something if you're not on something to stabilize the disease so that you're not progressing Doris um, says, please restate the benefits of milk thistle. Milk thistle is a uh, supplement, over-the-counter supplement, that is available at all of our chain pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens. Um, it's one pharmacy that's had some pretty extensive double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials for elevated liver cancer. Um, they, they tested it in people that had uh, a chemical hepatitis. In other words, people whose livers were inflamed because of exposure to chemicals. Drugs fall into that category. Um, and also people that had regular hepatitis and people that had alcoholic cirrhosis. And in all of those categories of people that were tested, um, <clears throat> their liver enzymes lowered on milk thistle versus placebo. They may have lowered on placebo, but they lowered significantly faster and more uh, profoundly on the milk thistle than they did on the placebo. Thanks for asking that again for clarification. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. So um, next Tuesday, um, the, the 9th of January at 4.30 in the afternoon, Dr. Ben Thrower is going to be doing his uh, monthly Ask the MS Expert webinar. So log in that. Um, what supplements Denise wants to know should we and should we not take? Um, thanks for that question, Denise. Almost everybody with MS should be on vitamin D3. We know that basically everybody with MS, initially, if they're not on supplementation, are going to have a very low vitamin D level. The normal levels for vitamin D are between 30 and 100. Um, <clears throat> we have been routinely in the past prescribing about 5,000 units a day of vitamin D for the average person living with MS. We'd like to see those levels, and until very recently, up around 60 or 70. We'd like them well north of 50. However, at the uh, Consortium of MS Centers annual meeting last year in uh, June, we were told that new studies had not borne out keeping those levels that high. There were no better outcomes in people that had uh, a vitamin D level of 35 to 50 than there were in those that were in the 70 to 100 range. 
So they're recommending because vitamin D can be toxic in some people, and the toxicity looks like progression or even a relapse. In some people, it can look like a severe gastroenteritis. So they're recommending that people not take more than five or 50,000 units per week. So there is a 50,000 unit dose that you take once a week, but not taking any more than 50,000 units a week, or you could actually be feeling worse than doing it. Now, I, I know that runs uh, counter to what we've been telling you all along. You should not be taking supplements that boost the immune system. Anything that says it's an immune booster, anything that is a combination of vitamins, minerals, herbal supplements, um, you don't want to be taken because there are, are ultimately immune boosters in most of those combination drugs. In fact, um, in our in our class, three hour class on drugs um, on supplements, vitamins and supplements last year with the consortium, they recommended that people that are on a multivitamin only take it every other day. Unless you're pregnant, unless you're pregnant or nursing or trying to conceive a child, then you're going to want to be taking it to just to make sure that you've got optimal levels on board. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question. And also thank you, Denise. Um, I'm seeing you, and I'm, I think you're the one real regular that I'm seeing all the time from. We appreciate your input and, and your contribution to this change. Um, the, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation has four Facebook pages at this point that are private. So your questions can't be seen by the general Facebook community. You have to be a member of that page to post. So the page that Denise is on is um, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation private Facebook page. We also have a public Facebook page that anybody can see. Um, that has about 25,000 members currently. We have a page called MS Focus Confidential, and that's for people living with MS. Not even our significant others come onto that page to see. It's only people living with MS. So it's not for people who think they might have a diagnosis and want to hear from those that have MS, what is is and is not potentially um, an MS symptom. We have one called MS Care Partners Only, and that's for individuals who have a loved one that they're that they're with much of the time or that they provide support to who is living with MS. And then we our newest Facebook page, which was developed about six or eight months ago is MS Focus on the LGBTQ community, or LGBT community, not the Q is not in the name. So um, if you go to the, the link that um, Bobby posted, that is the public page. And then you can also search for our private Facebook page and on the top of the private Facebook page, it will give you links to all of the other groups we've got um, that are private groups. Well, again, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. Uh, we look forward to seeing many of you at Dr. Thrower's Ask the MS Expert next Tuesday, January 9th at 4.30 in the afternoon. And for those of you that are on Zoom, please stay on the line as soon as the webinar ends, and we will and do a quick survey so that you can let us know what you'd like to see in the education offering during the conference. Thank you, and stay with us. Bye-bye.